Hello, welcome once again to Lato's Law. I'm Steve Lato. Today we're going to talk about a crazy case out of California. People often ask me about these crazy cases and they say, Steve, do you have one that's kind of a mind bender? And I say, yes, I do. <laughs> this is one where you can kind of see both sides and you can also probably also see the good defenses to both sides. And this is the one that you say, well, I, I you know, <laughs> it's a crazy case. So the California Supreme Court had to decide on this case called Blatty versus the New York Times. And, of course, it came out in 1986, and Blatty is William Peter Blatty, the man who wrote The Exorcist. And he wrote a book called Legion, which was selling so well that it was climbing the charts, as we say. And uh, when it got time to get on those bestseller lists, it was on the lists except for The New York Times, who simply chose not to include it for some reason. So when the publisher contacted The New York Times and said, hey, why isn't Legion on the bestseller list? It's a bestseller. The New York Times said, well, it's our list. We can put anybody we want on it. It's an editorial decision we're making. And they didn't think that was right, so they filed a lawsuit against the New York Times. And the argument was simply this. If there's a bestseller list or Casey Kasem's Top 40 or some kind of rating where you say, you know, these are the best-selling widgets in America, <laughs> then you assume that the widgets that are not listed must not be best-selling. And so... Mr. Blatty's arguing and saying, look, by leaving me off the list, you're saying I'm not a bestseller with this book, and this book is, and by the way, this is not an opinion. We can prove this mathematically. We can show you book sales, okay? We can show you the criteria that you claim to use, because they claim it's based on book sales. So leaving us off is wrong. Now, here's the question. If it's wrong, what law is broken? Okay, so this is, this is like I said, it's a mind bender. William Peter Blatty, Plaintiff versus New York Times. The fundamental question in this case is whether a newspaper can be held liable for failing to include a book in its list of bestsellers. And as we shall explain, the answer is no. At least this is the California Supreme Court talking. Plaintiff William Peter Blatty brought this action for damages against the defendant New York Times Company, publisher of the New York Times. Four causes of action were asserted in the original complaint. Negligent interference with prospective economic advantage intentional interference with prospective economic advantage, negligence, and trade libel. And I can tell you right now that the defendants in that case actually went to court and said, Your Honor, look at this complaint. It doesn't even state a claim of action, cause of action based on how it's phrased. And so Mr. Blatty and his side filed an amended complaint that included some more causes of action. But the court summarized all of it by saying, The allegations underlying each of these causes of action may be summarized as follows. Blatty is the author of a number of works of fiction, including The Exorcist, and a recently published novel entitled Legion. The Times publishes a weekly list purporting to rank best-selling books based on actual sales. Because many new books are published each year, authors whose hardback books appear on this list benefit by greater sales of the books themselves. So, for instance, if you walked into bookstores back then, they'd often say, the New York Times bestsellers, and they'd have the books right there on, on an end cap or right on a display you walk in the door. I remember times they actually had borders, for instance, where they'd say, you know, New York Times bestsellers are discounted, and they're put right here. You walk up, oh, that's a bestseller. And, and it, it, it puts these things in a prominent place. It helps booksellers. And trust me, I'm an, I'm, I'm an author, and all authors, if you're doing it right, are also booksellers. So we understand you got to write it, you got to get it published, then you got to sell it. So, you know, you do all this hard work and you find out that my book is a bestseller, but it's not on the list. So you can understand why that would hurt you. Um, Legion sold more than enough copies and met all other criteria to merit inclusion on the list. The Times, however, failed to include Legion, and as a result, Blatty suffered injury. With respect to the intentional interference claim, it is also alleged that Simon & Schuster provided the Times with information to the effect that Legion has sold more than enough copies, but the Times nevertheless refused to include the book. So in other words when they first heard about it, the publisher thought it was a mistake. They contacted the Times. And the Times said, well, you know, we can do what we're going to do. And, and the publishers said, well, look, we can give you the evidence. And they actually said that they gave them the documentation to prove, look, this is the proof, and just in case you don't know this. And apparently that didn't matter. So although they bear different labels, the four causes of action each have as their gravamen the alleged injurious falsehood of a statement that the Times falsely represented that the list was based on actual sales, and by failing to include Legion, the Times falsely represented that the novel did not meet its stated criteria for inclusion, 
And by these misrepresentations, the Times adversely affected the volume of sales by the hardback edition and consequently the value of the paperback and film rights, thereby subjecting Blatty to injury, which would be a, a pecuniary loss or a monetary injury. Before the Times responded to the complaint, Blatty then attempted to do some discovery, which I'm not going to get into. I've, I'm going to edit out a lot of this because this was actually a 12-page decision, which is short for a Supreme Court opinion, but California Supreme Court. Um, so... In his amended complaint, and I told you Blatty's first complaint, the court said this is probably deficient. Blatty asserted five causes of action, and um, <clears throat> excuse me, intentional interference with prospective economic advantage based on the Times, marketing of the list separate and apart from this newspaper publication, unfair competition. But again, all of this stuff boils down to they publish a list, they say the list is the best sellers, and yet they leave out a book. So the implications the book they're leaving up must not be a bestseller. But the interesting point here is the Times is not actually saying anything explicitly about the book because they're not mentioning it. Okay? So keep that in mind. Um, the allegations underlying each of these causes of action are essentially those stated in the original complaint, um, and, and that is that the Times falsely represented that the list was objective, unbiased, and accurate, and based on book sales of, you know, 2,000 bookstores, so on and so forth. And once again, although they bear different labels, the five causes of action each have the same allegations regarding the falsehood of a statement. And the falsehood hurts Batty, and that hurt is financial. And so that's the cause of action he's basically trying to get in. It's the question of how do you phrase it? Uh, the Times again basically said, with respect to the second complaint, again, this doesn't even count as a cause of action. We can't slander you, we can't libel you, we can't defame you if we aren't talking about you. In other words, most of the time when someone's bad-mouthing you, your first request is shut up, stop talking about me. The Times isn't talking about Batty. <laughs> he wants them to. So that's an interesting angle on this. So uh, the trial court dismissed the case. Well, the Court of Appeals reversed part of it and, and said they were going to send it back down. And then, of course, the Times appealed that, and that went up to the California Supreme Court. So here's the deal. The court talks about the different standards that they're going to look into and uh, whether or not Batty Blatty has, has, has come up with a cause of action here that's actionable. And in order to advance society's interest in free and open discussion on matters of public concern and to avoid undue self-censorship by the press, the First Amendment establishes a broad zone of protection within which the press may publish without fear of incurring liability on the basis of injurious falsehood. The necessity for this protection is clear. The First Amendment presupposes that the freedom to speak one's mind is not only an aspect of individual liberty and thus a good unto itself, but also is essential to the common quest for truth and vitality of society as a whole. Okay? The First Amendment establishes its broad zone of protection by means of various rules, two are especially implicated by the allegations of the original and amended complaints here. At the threshold in defamation actions, in which, of course, the alleged injurious falsehood of a statement is the main part of the plaintiff's claim, the amendment has abrogated the common law of strict liability. For constitutional purposes, it is not enough that the traditional affirmative defense of truth with the burden of proof on the defendant be available to the press, Rather, it is the plaintiff who is required to plead and prove falsehood. So if you're going to claim it, <clears throat> a, a big news organization has slandered you, libeled you, or whatever, you've got to actually prove it to them as opposed to having them defend themselves. It's a slightly different issue here. Um, and they give some examples here. And a, a, one case says that uh, the plaintiff, if, if the plaintiff is a public official or public figure, in order to carry his burden, he must prove actual malice. And that's to demonstrate with clear and convincing evidence that the defendant realized that his statement was false, or that he subjectively entertained a serious doubt as to the truth of, its state, of his statement. And then, of course, when a plaintiff is a private individual, he must prove that the defendant made the falsehood with at least negligence. But in defamation actions, the First Amendment also requires that the statement on which the claim is based must specifically refer to or be of and concerning the plaintiff in some way. So the question here really is, Understanding this is all flowing from the First Amendment. Did the New York Times, when they published a bestseller list that didn't mention Blatty, did they make a statement 
of and concerning Vladdy. That's really what it boils down to. And so, you know, obviously, you can say, well, a person reading this list and who knows the whole story could say that the Times is making a statement with their silence, right? I mean, sometimes silence can be louder than words. You know, it depends, the context and so on. But the question is, but is that necessarily a statement of and concerning the author they did not mention? And by the way, here's the interesting point, is that of the books in America that could be on that list, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of them. So every time they put this list out, are they making a statement of and concerning every single book that's not on the list? It's another issue. The of and concerning or specific reference requirement limits the right of action for injurious falsehood, granting it to those who are the direct object of criticism and denying it to those who merely complain of non-specific statements that they believe cause them some hurt. To allow a plaintiff who is not identified, either expressly or by clear implication, to institute such an action poses an unjustifiable threat to society. For example, as a federal court has cautioned, the absence of the of and concerning requirement could invite any number of vexatious lawsuits and seriously interfere with public discussion of issues or groups which are in the public eye. Statements about a religious, ethnic, or political group could invite thousands of lawsuits from disgruntled members of those groups claiming that the portrayal is inaccurate and thus libelous. So you can imagine, for instance, if the news shot footage of a huge crowd of people and said, look at these, look at these people who are out of control. And someone who's in the crowd who's not out of control could sue and say, you, you called me out of control. I'm a member, and, you know. So there's, there's a, a possibility that, that that, if they allowed it, could get out of control. Such suits would be especially damaging to the media and could result in the public receiving less information about topics of general concern. And, and you can imagine that, the chilling effect that would have. The of and concerning requirement serves to immunize a kind of statement which, though it can cause hurt to an individual, is deemed too important to the vigor and openness of public discourse in a free society to be discouraged. Statements of opinion, however pernicious, are immunized by the First Amendment in order to ensure that the cor correction depends not on the conscience of judges and juries, but in the competition of other ideas. And yeah, you don't want this stuff all being litigated. That's not what the courts are for, okay? You, you do want a robust debate in the public space on issues of importance. Not only does logic compel the conclusion that First Amendment limitations are applicable to all claims of whatever label, whose gravamen is the alleged injurious falsehood of a statement, but so too does a very pragmatic concern. If these limitations applied only to actions denominated as defamation, they would furnish little, if any, protection to free speech and free press issues. Plaintiffs suing press defendants might simply affix a label other than defamation to their claims, and that's one of the things the court's pointing out, is this guy filed a six-count complaint, and each count had a different name, and slightly different twists on what their legal theory was, but they all stated the exact same cause of action in reality. They left me off their list. I should have been on the list. I got hurt. They owe me money. Well, what you call that is still basically the same cause of action. So the court's saying, we don't care what you call the cause of action. We're going to look at it and ask ourselves what it really is. So the causes of action for intentional interference with prospective economic advantage, as stated, are barred by the First Amendment here. It is plain that Blatty's intentional interference claims have as their gravamen <laughs> the alleged injurious falsehood of a statement. Under the allegations of the amended complaint, the assertion they make is as follows. The time falsely represented, the list was accurate. By failing to include Legion, the times falsely represented, the novel did not meet his criteria. By doing so, they caused him harm. And it's the same thing. So it is also plain that Blatty's intentional interference claims fail to satisfy First Amendment requirements. Uh, and that's basically it. So what we're talking about, and by the way, they say, finally, the list cannot be reasonably understood to refer to Blatty directly or his novel by implication. Uh, when, as in this case, the statement that is alleged to be injuriously false concerns a group, because remember, Blatty didn't make the list, but 
so did all of the other books not on the list. And here's the thing. The allegation really was that anybody in the know who would look at the actual sales figures and then see this list would go, wait, this book didn't get included. And the problem, of course, is that the New York Times says, look, we have the right to leave books off our list and we have the right to play with the order on the list. And it's clear now that the New York Times bestseller list is not, at least at the time, based 100% on sales. Just, you know, this is the number one seller in the country, the number two seller in the country. Well, they're on the list, but apparently there's other criteria. And they're allowed to do the list any way they want. You know, for years, there was billboard lists for songs or cash box lists and American Top 40, I forgot where they got theirs from, and in different countdowns, they'd say, here's where we're getting our list from. And if you listened to the lists and compared them, <clears throat> the lists were never identical. And that's because many of them said, well, we're basing this on record sales, we're basing this on radio airplay, or basing this on some combination of, of, of the two. There were stories for years that there were editors at some of the publications that put out lists, can't say which ones, uh, that they were accepting bribes. And if you had a song that was at number 41 on the list, if you could get it bumped one spot to number 40, and that was the list being used by, say, Casey Kasem, your song just got added to a playlist that got syndicated on thousands of radio stations around the country, and, of course, to our armed forces overseas. So it'd be worth a little bit of money to the right person if you could bump it onto that list. You know, So you can understand why there's issues here. But the simple point is that the New York Times says, hey, it's our list, we can do anything we want with it, and if we want to leave somebody off, we can, we want to put somebody on, we can. But it's not a specific statement concerning Mr. Blatty. And, of course, that's what the New York Times says. They often put the word Mr. in front of the names. So that's the thing. So in the end, they threw the lawsuit out and said, no cause of action here. You haven't been slandered, libeled, or defamed because we didn't mention you. You weren't mentioned. And like I said before, if someone's talking bad about you, the first thing you want to do is stop talking about you. <laughs> here he's saying he wishes they'd start talking about him. And, you know, it's an interesting theory, but this is a great example of something where most people would say, that's wrong. And then you say, yeah, but what law was broken? And that's the problem. So, you know, once in a while you hear about these oddball cases, and it's really here just something that nobody probably ever anticipated happening. And it happened. So there you have it, Blatty versus the New York Times. They left him off the list, but it turns out it's not wrong, but it cost both sides a lot of time and litigation. Questions or comments, put them below. I'll just talk to you later. Bye-bye.